Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountain. He sat down, and his disciples came to him. So the first few verses of our reading today do set the scene a little bit for the rest of our reading, um, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, known as the Beatitudes, a few of the more upbeat snippets that follow before Jesus goes on to talk about murder and adultery <laughs> and hypocrisy, which we are not going to, you know, explicitly cover those parts today. But I want to give a bit of extra context that we missed between Jesus's time in the wilderness, which some of us explored last week in Church in the Small, and uh, this sermon of his. So after his time in the desert, Jesus returns and he learns that his cousin John has been imprisoned. He begins traveling around, uh, around Judea, and he continues the work of preaching repentance that John was doing. So along the way, he calls his first disciples by the Sea of Galilee um, and asks them to join him in this ministry. And they begin traveling from town to town and synagogue to synagogue, preaching, teaching, healing those who are seeking healing. And the gospel writer tells us that the word of Jesus's ministry started to spread and it spread very far in a very short period of time. So many people who were in need of this ministry began traveling and gathering around him. So the people Jesus is speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount and in this reading, those are the people that have traveled, I mean, whether from far or near, to and have heard of his ministry, heard of the teaching and the healing that he's doing um, and his work with the people on the edges of society. Uh, they've been, they're coming to receive what they've heard that he's been offering. The crowd that is gathered is in search of something. They have needs that their families, communities, society haven't been able to meet. In other words, it's their need, their vulnerability that have brought them to this place. They've gathered outside of any institutional setting, right? It's a Sermon on the Mount in this case, even though Jesus has also been teaching in synagogues where he was in a space where there's an existing power structure. In this case, he and his listeners are outdoors and they're outside of any town or village or other place where, you know, an established authority or set of rules is closely governing what they do or what they say. In this place, it's possible to center the needs of those in the crowd who have come to hear Jesus. And there's no need to try to appease any particular authority or to speak according to conventional wisdom. In Jesus's time, as is the case today, the further you are from the centers of power and control, the looser their hold often is on what can and can't be said or done. So that is a context for the readings that we'll hear today. And so here's a bit more information about, you know, how we're going to invite you to reflect on this story together. So as Beth mentioned, instead of one reading in a sermon or even one way of reflecting, We've broken things down into smaller pieces. So if anybody's ever been to a lessons and carol service or even our um, longest night service is set up a little bit like this and uses a similar structure. So each section will begin with a scripture reading and then uh, be followed by a short invitation to reflection by either Beth or me. Then after that, there'll be some kind of response. So a song or the prayers of the people or communion. So in this way, the sermon is woven through the whole service. This can be helpful for people who have shorter attention spans, and um, it also gives Beth and I a chance to invite reflection on um, through different ways and on different parts of our worship, which are sometimes further removed from the sermon. So 
Uh, this is just one way that we can mix things up every once in a while, adding variety to the way that we worship. And because we're working in shorter sections, it also makes moving between our different worship spaces a bit easier since there are more frequent transitions. So if you've been waiting for a good moment to try out these spaces, um, this might be the moment. One last note I want to make is about the translation that Beth and I have chosen to use for today's reading. Rather than the New Revised Standard Version, which is the translation we frequently use, not always, for Bible readings, we're using the Common English Bible. This translation tries to use sort of more everyday language than the New Revised Standard Version. By using a more modern word order and things like contractions, that most English speakers use in our daily lives, in our regular speech. This can help us hear Bible readings in a fresh way. One of the main different word choices that this version of the Beatitudes makes is using the word happy instead of the word blessed or blessed. So Beth and I will talk a little bit more about this later, but I want, wanted to invite you to be open to how this word change in particular makes this Bible, these Bible passages, I guess, land differently for you. So I think that's enough of an introduction for now. Let's get this show on the road. <laughs> we're gonna pretend we're the, the crowds coming up on the mountain to, to listen to Jesus by singing a sort of gathering song about the kingdom, which is really what Jesus is preaching about. This is a song where we're inviting people to choose one part out of three layered parts according to you know, what you like, what pronouns for God you like to use, or where your voice might sit the best. We're gonna teach you those three parts. And then you get to decide uh, which one you wanna go with and kind of sing repetitively. I'm gonna sing the middle part during our sort of layered section. Uh, Caitlin's gonna sing the upper part and I'll also cue the lower part because we don't have three of us up here. So, uh, so we're gonna teach you these parts first. I'm gonna invite you to stand if you're able and you're here. And at home, if you're on Zoom, you can also choose a part and sing along with us. So can you give me the, the A? Yeah. All right, so the first part goes like this. Oh, let me get mine. Right. Goes, great is he who's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is wonderful. Let's try that again. Great is he who's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is wonderful. Part two goes like this. It's going to sound really good. So let's go uh, one, two, three, four.
All right, who's got our scripture reading number two? Okay, Bailey. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Jesus taught them, saying, Happy are people who are hopeless, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve, because they will be made glad. Jesus starts out with the weirdest beatitudes. Happy are the hopeless? Happy are the grievers? Sounds like healthy are the sick or alive are the dead. <laughs> hopeless, grieving people don't feel happy. But in Jesus' eyes, they are happy, well off, fortunate. Instead of happy, one of my professors called this, uh, they translated the passage, congratulations, you lucky dogs. <laughs> congratulations to the hopeless. Or as Luke wrote, the poor. And some translate this word in Matthew as poor in spirit. But don't take that to be a romanticized, spiritualized poverty. No, this is poverty so desperate that it hits you physically and spiritually. The word describes people so poor that they have to beg, so poor that they're utterly hopeless. The world does not bless people like them. The world says, happy are the go-getters, the well-educated, the well-connected ones, for theirs is financial security. But Jesus is switching the price tags. Jesus is teaching us a new way to see, a new way of naming, a new way of being. No, Jesus says, not happy are the financially secure. No, happy are the bankrupt. Happy are those who can't hold it together anymore. Happy are those who admit they are powerless, who are working their step one, if you know A. <laughs> happy are those who can't even try to earn or buy their way in. Happy are those who know their only hope is in a God who might see their hopeless state. Happy are those whose hands are empty enough to receive the kingdom. Happy are those who will not let capitalism or any other system dictate their worth. Jesus is essentially saying God's favor is not found in status, in position, in wealth. In Luke's version, he drives it home even further. Woe to you who are rich. We're gonna sing that in a song later. It's hard to sing. <laughs> the kingdom belongs to the hopeless poor. It already belongs to them. Theirs is the kingdom, present tense. And congratulations to those who grieve, you lucky dogs, who wail in piercing sorrow as at a Middle Eastern funeral. Happy are those who know that following Jesus is not about putting on a happy face, not about pretending everything is fine. Happy are those who hold vigil at the graves of their loved ones, like Jesus, man of sorrows, weeping at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Happy are those who don't numb themselves to the world's pain, but who let themselves melt in empathy, sitting in the trenches with those harmed by oppression. Those who let themselves be stretched and widened in their capacity to hold suffering. They will be made glad, they will be comforted, Glad at the end when Jesus creatively redeems the pain of the world, but not just at the end, also comfort along the way. The word Jesus uses here is parakaleo, and that might sound kind of like paraclete to you, which is a name that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes alongside those who grieve and offers them surprising tenderness, even while they're following, falling apart. I have felt this myself. So is Jesus saying, hey, everyone, be more hopeless, <laughs> be more grievy, <laughs> more and more. No, later Jesus does tell some people to give away their possessions. And later Jesus does say that they will grieve when he's taken from them. But here, Jesus is not telling us what to do. Jesus is blessing, blessing those whom our world does not bless. Hopeless people whose pain can make us uncomfortable. Grieving people we usually are trying not to become. <laughs> so instead of turning these beatitudes into a virtue checklist, let's receive Jesus's invitation to learn a new way of seeing the world. He's introducing an upside down kingdom, a messy kingdom found in different places than we expect. Will we welcome and echo his blessing on those we usually try to avoid? 
Congratulations, you hopelessly impoverished people, you grievers, you mourners, you lucky dogs. We're gonna take a minute to respond to this part of the, the reading with some silent reflection. So I invite you into some silence. So who has reading number three? Is it online? Yeah, great. Kevin, I think. Whenever you're ready. Matthew chapter five, verses five and six. Happy are people who are humble because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they're full. After the absurdity of the first two Beatitudes, happy are the humble might seem more like an obvious statement. The word humble might make you picture someone who is quiet and modest and self-effacing and content with what they have. But what if this said, happy are the humiliated, happy are the debased, happy are the belittled? Or what about happy are the lower class, happy are the undistinguished, happy are the invisible and overlooked, happy are the insecure, those who try to make themselves smaller, those who are trying to disappear? Similarly, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness seem like a group that even our society might honor and respect, a group whose pursuit for justice might well be a source of joy in their lives. Well, that is only true until your hunger or thirst for righteousness causes you to set boundaries or call out someone else's harmful behavior or to point out how the systems in our society aren't meeting people's needs. Happy are the killjoys and buzzkills and the woke. <laughs> and even more than that, when we look at how these two groups overlap, we might recognize those who through injustice are longing, hungry, thirsty, but don't believe they're good enough to deserve love or care or mercy or friends, or support, or life. Jesus is speaking to those who find themselves in the pit of despair, on the outside, and believe that's where they deserve to be. And Jesus is speaking a word of blessing to these people. He's offering them validation of their struggles and naming their inherent worth and value. Jesus doesn't need them to change or ignore how they feel or change their position in the world in order to name their worthiness. They don't need to feel entitled or know they have the short end of the stick for Jesus to say that they deserve the world. 
and they deserve to have their deepest needs met, to be full. Just because someone has lost sight of their own value and belovedness doesn't mean God has lost sight of it. In our longing and in our shame, God is holding on to our belovedness. And Jesus in this sermon is offering blessings to those who think they least deserve them because they've never received what they most deeply need to be well. I'm going to invite Tony to lead us in a time of prayer. So this is our opportunity to jointly give our thanks to God, to jointly, to communally, uh, as a church body, give our thanks to God, to lift up our concerns to God, and to seek God's guidance as we move out into the week and into the world. And I'll be leading the prayer, but I'll pause at times and leave moments of silence for each of us to both lift up specific prayers and leave space to listen and wait on God's presence. I'll be closing with the Lord's Prayer, which is printed in your bulletin. And it's on this, I think will be on the screen. Uh, and you're very welcome to also join in at that point. God, you have so many names, uh, each of which provides us with insights into who you are, but none of which captures you entirely. God, our creator, our provider, our shepherd, God of all grace, the God who sees, God of love. We thank you for the day that you've made. We thank you for the celebrations of the Lunar New Year, that it marks a time of new beginnings and of coming together. We thank you for this place that you've provided for us to come and meet with others and to meet with you. We thank you for Mark and for what he's brought to Open Way, the time and care and the passion that he's devoted to it. And we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate with Mark and Shirley after the service. We thank you for the opportunity to walk through your teaching today, uh, for the opportunity to sit with what it means to be hopeless, to grieve, to be on the outside, to struggle with our work, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to need righteousness, to need justice, to show and receive mercy, to have pure hearts, to be peacemakers, to be persecuted or harassed, to sit with those feelings of discomfort, to sit with others in places of discomfort and to learn from them. Thank you that when we feel hopeless, that when we're grieving, you are there. We lift up to you those in our families, our communities, our lives, ourselves who need your hope, your comfort, and your presence. And we take a moment in silence to lift up people in our lives mm -hmm. who need your care. We thank you, Lord, that when we feel abandoned, when we feel that we're outsiders, when we feel lost, when we feel alone, you tell us that we're beloved. And you tell us that we are your creation. Lord, create in us a hunger and thirst for righteousness for all of those who feel less than, for all of those who feel outsiders, for your justice. And we lift up to you the fundamental injustices in our society, in our cities, in our province, in our country, in the world. 
And Lord, show us what you want of us in response. We think of the ongoing struggle for true and meaningful reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. We think of today's shooting in Monterey Park and the ongoing issues of gun violence. We think of the war in the Ukraine and the people so directly impacted. We looked up the impact of illegal mining and government inaction on the Yanomami people in the Amazon, the crackdown on anti-government protesters in Bangladesh, and a listing of injustices could take much longer than this service. So Lord, I, we take a moment of silence to lift up what you have placed on our hearts. Lord, help us to be peacemakers. Help us to see the world like you do and let that be our guide for how to be in the world. Help us to live our lives rooted in your mercy and your grace and let our interactions and responses to those around us be marked with that mercy and grace. Help us to see you as we walk through our days and through our lives. Help us to be rooted in your presence and your teaching as we walk through our days and through our lives, help us to love your creation and to live out that love in concrete, meaningful ways. Help us to be your presence in our communities, families, and world as we walk through our days and our lives. And now I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer in whatever language is closest to your heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Just wanted to mention that if you want to continue praying in different ways, we also have a prayer station over here with candles, and maybe someone will come to mind as we're going through these sections, and you'll want to go light a candle for them during, uh, during one of the songs, perhaps. You're welcome to use that station. Can we have reader, reader number four? Who do we have for this fourth? Oh, hello, Jennifer. Jennifer is Dana's sister visiting uh, from, well, all over the place. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Matthew 5, 7 to 8. Happy are people who show mercy because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts because they will see God. Congratulations, you who show mercy, you who have pure hearts, you lucky dogs. Pure dogs, that's different. <laughs> um, again, mercy, purity, these are virtues, right? Maybe blessing merciful, pure-hearted people seems more obvious than hopeless, grieving, hungry folks. But in our world, merciful, pure-of-heart people are more often mocked than blessed. Those who show mercy might be called pushovers, chumps, suckers. But Jesus says, happy are the merciful. Happy are those who lend to people who won't repay them. Happy are those who cover the bill, who cancel the debt. Happy are those who don't ask if someone deserves it before offering help. Happy are those who resist the desire for payback, who don't police their neighbors, who don't press charges, who, don't, who treat their enemies tenderly as fellow flawed human beings. Happy are those who forgive over and over again. They will receive mercy. They have stopped requiring others to earn their mercy and love, and this makes them ready to receive God's mercy and love, which could never be earned. And congratulations to those whose hearts are pure, not pure as in chaste or virginal or clean, but pure as in unmixed, undiluted, like pure maple syrup, perhaps. <laughs> happy
Happy are those who have pure hearts, those the world would call naive, gullible, overly trusting. Happy are those who have so much sincerity in them that sarcastic jokes go right over their heads. Happy are those who wear their hearts on their sleeves, leaving them vulnerable to harm. Happy are those with integrity, those who are the same person with everyone they meet, transparent before God and others. Happy are those who are imperfect but whole. They will see God. Could there be a better promise seeing God, seeing face to face, the one who made you, who's maybe invisible? How does this happen? I wonder if the pure in heart with their love of truth are given the ability to see God in all of God's creatures, especially those overlooked by others. With the merciful and the pure in heart, Jesus is blessing groups of people who are easily taken advantage of in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, but who will hold places of honor in his kingdom. Will we welcome and echo this blessing? Congratulations, you who show mercy. You who have pure hearts, you lucky dogs. We're gonna respond in song. And this is a song we're gonna sing through twice, so you'll get the hang of it as we go. It's pretty repetitive. And you're welcome to stay seated for this, but you know, if you feel like standing, you can do that too. It goes like this. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 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 We'll come back to that part, but we're going to keep moving. Forgive us as we forgive. 
Yeah, number five? You want to say five? <laughs> Last count. Oh, great. Matthew 5, verse 9 to 12. Happy are people who make peace, because they will be called God's children. Happy are people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad, because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. Peace can be a tricky and slippery word. Sometimes it's used to speak about the absence of conflict or a kind of ceasefire, a pause in hostilities. What I like about this translation of the Beatitudes is that it highlights that making peace is active. To my ear, peacemakers sounds like it re refers to a specific group of people whose job is peace. But this translation, people who make peace, feels to me more like this is work anyone can do and can be doing, and it is an action. Peace isn't the absence of something, but rather making peace is a creative, constructive action. It isn't avoiding conflict. It isn't ignoring harm. It isn't grinning and bearing it. It isn't not making a fuss. Making peace is doing the work of bringing our needs and values into conversation with those of others around us. Making peace happens in relationship. It is teamwork and it makes the dream work. <laughs> in white supremacist culture, and honestly, in any context where there's an unfair system of power, the dominant group will often suggest that the oppressed naming their oppression are disturbing the peace. You can also see this meaning of the word peace in the phrase keeping the peace, as opposed to making peace, which we see in this translation. In keeping the peace, there's a strong association between peace and the status quo. Did you know that in many places, police are called peace officers? It is clear to me that the peace in their case is the status quo, regardless of the harm it causes to some. In our Canadian context, there's often a contrast made between the underlying constitutional values of our neighbors to the South, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and a similar semantic structure in our own foundational documents, peace, order, and good government. But Canadian smugness aside, if we listen to the voices of the marginalized and oppressed in our own context, it becomes clear whose peace and what kind of order and whose governments are considered good. Jesus is not blessing those who avoid conflict, but rather those who dig in and do the hard and messy work of bringing it out into the open and resolving it in relationship. And then we hear Jesus pronounce a blessing to those who are harassed and insulted and lied about because of their righteousness. Jesus tells us they are like the prophets. It's a mixed blessing. Now, there are certainly a lot of people who are happy to point to ways in which they are being harassed for their righteousness, persecuted because they are free thinkers, excluded because of the things they say or do. This is one of the central claims of far right and conservative people in the world today. Not only is that their claim, but in Christian context, they often use this very scripture verse to support their claims that they're being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. So it can feel like this verse has lost its usefulness. And of course, it's completely valid to feel that way, especially when it's been used so often in ways 
that have caused us harm. So what is this righteousness and how can we tell if what someone is calling harassment is what Jesus is referring to here? I think it can be helpful to remember that making peace isn't the same thing as maintaining the status quo. The, that the people who make peace don't avoid conflict or hard truths or ignore each other's needs and vulnerabilities but name the tensions and competing needs and work together to resolve and address them. Also, it is important not to let some people's commitment to ignoring what is true in the world make us believe that truth doesn't exist and everything is relative. Just because TERFs keep saying trans women are not women and instead are a danger, does it mean that trans women and trans femmes aren't actually the ones who are experiencing harms and oppression, for example? Cis people aren't being harmed by being near trans people living our lives or by our survival and well being. The fact that they need to lie and fear monger in order to try and maintain their place of privilege in the status quo, well, that's how we can tell that transness, like queerness, and disability, and indigeneity, and blackness, is prophetic. There are two short sections of scripture left, but now brings us to the end of the Beatitudes section. So I'm going to invite us to take a moment and wonder together about this story. We're going to use a practice from Godly Play, which is a Montessori based approach to spiritual formation. Um, and we're going to use something called wondering questions. So I'm going to offer prompts um, and then leave some space for silent or spoken responses. So wondering can happen inside in our hearts and minds and bodies, or it can be shared aloud. Or if you're online, it can be written in the chat. For the sake of our being able to hear each other, um, I'm going to repeat what people offer out loud. Um, I might not be able to get everything in the chat because the type is too small for me to read. So, um, But I will, will repeat things uh, people say out loud from Zoom. So wondering is different from a discussion or dialogue. The idea is not to respond to what anyone else in the group offers, but to let different responses and ideas and interpretations sit next to one another, like different drawings of the same scene. So I want us to think back, and I mean, you can even look back in your bulletin over what we've heard of this story so far. And let's wonder together about the Beatitudes. I wonder what your favorite part of this story is. Can you say it again? That I'm loved broken. That I'm loved broken. I wonder what wholeness looks like. I wonder what wholeness looks like. <laughs> the part where Jesus saw all the people and then ran away. <laughs> I 
I wonder what the most important part of the story is. I wonder if it's who Jesus chooses not to bless. I wonder if it's who Jesus chooses not to bless. I wonder how we can bless each other here within open way. I wonder how we can bless each other here within open way. The upside down kingdom. Uh, and they is this hope that the pain won't last forever. I wonder how long I'll have to endure. My fave is the hope that the pain won't last forever. I wonder how long I'll have to endure. I wonder what part of this story is especially for you today or where you see yourself in the story. I wonder what part of this story we could leave out and still have all the story we need. Oh. I wonder where you feel this story in your body or your emotions. We have our sixth scripture reading. Who's got that one? Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. Thank you, Jack. Congratulations, you bunch of ordinary nobodies. You hopeless, grieving, humble, hungry, merciful, pure, peacemaking, harassed ones. You lucky dogs, you are salt. The Romans said there's nothing, nothing more useful than salt and sun, sale and sole. And Roman soldiers got rations of salt. That's where we get our word salary from. You are a valuable commodity. Salt enhances flavor. You give zest and add vitality to this world. Salt makes people thirsty. You create thirst for the living water Jesus gives. Salt cleanses wounds. You promote healing in your communities. Salt preserves food. It keeps it from spoiling. So you keep society fresh. You hold back ethical decay. 
And here's my favorite one. You may have heard me preach about this before, but you are the salt of the earth or another valid translation. You are the salt of the earthen oven. In the Middle East, in Jesus's time, and even today, people would often cook outdoors in clay ovens. For fuel, they would use camel and donkey poop mixed with, you guessed it, salt. The salt dried up the moisture and made it more flammable. They also put plates of salt at the bottom of the oven and it helped activate the fire and make it burn more evenly. And eventually those salt plates would wear out under the heat and people would toss them out into the street with the trash to be trampled under people's feet. Remember the verse? But even then the salt is helpful because it dries out the mud and it gives traction and strength to the road. You are the salt of the earthen oven. Even when you're mixed up in crap, you can get things cooking. <laughs> even under pressure, you burn bright. Even when you feel used up and worthless, trampled on the street, you're not trash, you're traction. God sees the worth in you. You are the salt of the earth. You don't have salt, you are salt. No conditions. You don't have to fix things up in your lives to be saltier. You don't have to muster or summon up your saltiness. Jesus, again, is teaching us a new way of seeing the world and a new way of seeing ourselves. So believe who you are and become it. Salty ones, I'm now going to invite you to the communion table to eat and drink with Jesus, to eat and drink Jesus, <laughs> to eat bread likely made with at least a pinch of salt. A little goes a long way. So come and renew your connection to this salty savior. Here at, at St. Margaret's, we're gonna come and I'm gonna invite in a second, Joy and Miriam to come and serve you some little containers with a piece of bread and a grape in it. And then at home, if you wanna grab something to eat and something to drink, after we sing a song together, we will all receive together. Uh, let's pray together as we start this. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you for teaching us new ways to see the world. May this shared ritual, this bread and grape, this body and blood continue to shape us into people who know how to receive your kingdom. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this and remember me. And then after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you, shed for forgiveness. Blessed are the merciful. <laughs> forgiveness of sins. Do this, drink this, and remember. So let's uh, read. We've got a little reading for this part that we do together just to remind ourselves what this meal means. And I think Tuesday we'll put it on the screen here. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come and receive. Joy and uh, Miriam, if you'd come and serve, great. There's gluten-free vegan on the table if you need it. So we're, we're gonna eat our food after, just so people know. <laughs> we're gonna to a song now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll keep your mouth busy. <laughs>
let's receive together, eat and drink. The Lord is with us. Amen. So our last bit of scripture is Kim, maybe? Great. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they will put it on top of a lamp stand and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Thanks. So in our readings today, we've heard Jesus offer a series of upside down, even absurd blessings to those that this world often looks down upon. This last few verses is painting a picture of the kind of transformation Jesus is hoping to inspire with his words of blessing. This image of not hiding a light, but instead making it visible, putting it where it can be seen, is like why we say Black Lives Matter or have pride parades or lift up the diversity of people and experiences in our communities. So before we're sent out with a, a final song and then a blessing that happens after announcements, um, <laughs> I wanna invite you to take a moment and together we're gonna breathe in Jesus's words of blessing spoken to the crowds thousands of years ago. And now again, to you all today. So I invite you if you're comfortable to close your eyes or just cast your gaze downward. G-A-Z-E gaze. <laughs> and I invite you to breathe in the love of God and breathe out fear. Breathe in the love of God. And breathe out shame. And breathe in the love of God. And breathe out longing. And breathe in love of the love of God and breathe out grief and to keep breathing in and out until you breathe in the love of God and breathe out the love of God. that you can feel it warming inside you like a light that's the light of the world on a lampstand, a city on a hill. It shines on all. Amen. We're going to do a song. Yeah. I think we, we attempted to make this service shorter. We're not entirely successful at that.